Good morning and uh, welcome to this, the 11th meeting of 2015 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones um, be switched off or on silent? And uh, we are going straight into the agenda this morning. Agenda item one is for committee to do, um, decide whether we can take agenda item four in private. Agreed. Yeah, is that agreed? Thank and you any, very any much. Any future consideration? Oh, yes, and any future consideration of the work programme. Agreed. Thank you. Um, agenda item two is a substantive issue in our committee this morning, which is a continuation of our inquiry on Connecting Scotland. And today we are looking at the cultural and sports aspects of our uh, place in the world and the, what we give and what we get from the world on that. And we have a number of um, representatives from across all of our organisations in Scotland to do. And what I'll do is I'll go around the table and let everybody introduce themselves. So I'm Christina McKelvey. I'm the convener of the European and External Relations Committee. I'm the Vice Convener, my name is Hansel Amalek and I'm from MSP for Glasgow. I'm Willie Coffey, MSP for Kilmarnock and Durban Valley. I'm Neil Murray, I'm the Executive Producer of the National Theatre of Scotland. I'm Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. I'm Stu Fowley, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Scottish Student Sport. Adam Ingram, MSP for Carrick, Cumnock and Dune Valley. I'm Mary Allison, I'm Head of Strategic Planning at Sports Scotland. Uh, Lloyd Anderson, Director of British Council, Scotland. Uh, Stuart Turner, I'm the Head of Events, Scotland. Janet Archer, Chief Executive Creative, Scotland. Jamie McGregor, MSP, Islands and Islands. Liam Sinclair, Executive Producer of Scottish Dance Theatre. Anne McTaggart, MSP for Glasgow Area. Thank you very much indeed. Can I thank the, the witnesses who have come along to see and others who have given us written evidence. It's been very, very helpful. I have to say that this inquiry has, inge has generated a lot of interest across lots of sectors and we have had much reading to do um, to, to understand the work that, that's, that's going on. If you can see that we're in a sort of a round table type um, set up this morning and if we want to sort of a, create a bit of a free flow of movement this morning as far as conversation goes but if you can just catch my eye and make sure that I can bring you in so that it's a bit um, a, a, a wee bit structured but hopefully not too structured and, and you get to enjoy the actual interactions across the, the, the table um, so if you can do that that would be excellent um, we, I've got a quick opening question this morning I think maybe for, for you all and it's um, obviously Scotland in my opinion, from what I see, and certainly from my visit uh, to Scotland Week in, in New York, is that all of our national companies and all of our organisations, whether it is, you know, Sports Scotland or National Theatre or Creative Scotland or, or, or you know, the British Council, seem to, to be known uh, around, around the world and um, and certainly known for the work that, that, it, that it does. You just mentioned Black Watch or, you know, the Commonwealth Games or anything like that. People um, have got a, a keen understanding of what Scotland ha has, has given to the world. So I think maybe my open question is what uh, other interesting, you know, events, um, programmes and projects are you involved in that you think, you know, not only... Um, a, maintains but sustains and pushes forward you know, some of the, the connections that we've got around the world and how do we use that um, to tell our story? I'm looking at you, Neil. <laughs> Last in, first to speak, <laughs> just the rule. We were expecting you to come in uh, and pirouette and dance into your sorry, seat. Sorry, apologies, no. apologies for that. Um, actually, I think sometimes it's, it's not so much about the big one-off events, it's about a consistency of presence and profile. Um, the big one-off events are fantastic and big festivals, you know, you're often there with great companies from around the world. But for us, for the National Theatre of Scotland, I think where we've managed to, to gain a reputation is through by consistently visiting and travelling. Um, I did a paper for my board the other day, which I'll leave for this committee as well. Um, and we've, we've done 17 international tours in eight years, um, a lot of them in places like the USA. So, for example, we were just in Chicago for the fifth time and it's that level of familiarity that you go there and an audience actually come there to see the National Theatre of Scotland because they've seen our work on two or three occasions previously. It's not always the same people but this start, you start to build a kind of grand swell, the press in those cities start to notice you. Um, particularly without being, we, when you tour abroad you tend to take your best work as well. <laughs> I'm sure Liam and other people will acknowledge that. You don't take the shows that don't really work, you take the shows that work so they see the best of you. 
Um, and I think it's, so for us, it's been um, a consistency of, of, and that's quite hard and we're lucky, you know, that's be, we're, we're a bigger company than many of the companies in Scotland. We've had the benefit of uh, Scottish Government International Touring Fund, which has been a fantastic help to us in, in achieving that profile. But I think if you do it as one-off visits, it tends not to have the same, it's, it, every time it feels like the first time then, whereas if you're going back, even if it's to a, not the same places, but they've, they've heard, oh, they were in Washington last year, they were in Chicago, they were in Sydney, wherever. It's not just a holiday tour, by the way, it is work, it's very hard work. Um, so I think it's that consistency I would suggest is, is the key thing. shows that, that that international um, element of, of the organizations that we fund, that bit of their work is really important. So something like 80% of the regularly funded organizations that Creative Scotland funds work internationally. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm not sure whether this is an accurate statistic, but I was told the other day that only 8% of Scottish business at this point exports internationally. So that's that's quite a, an, an interesting statistic. So the opportunity, I think, through cultural engagement in other countries could open up a real uh, real scope in, t in, in terms of taking Scotland's brand, uh, not, not, not just in terms of culture, but all that surrounds culture in places in Scotland into different parts of the world. So we're, we're just about to produce our creative industry strategy and we'll be very much fo focusing on that sense of place and global reach uh, as, as, as one key strand within, within that strategy. Floyd? Um, <coughs> well, uh, th I think the, the number of points there, were, coming back to the um, <coughs> government's um, economic strategy, uh, under internationalization, th there are two areas there. One, one is about um, influencing the world around Scotland, so it's about promoting uh, Scotland abroad. Uh, and, and uh, bringing the issues that matter most to, to helping Scotland to flourish by promoting Scotland uh, in the world. <clears throat> the other is about creating an environment within Scotland that uh, supports a better understanding of international opportunities. And I think um, that international mindset at home, uh, I think that Janet's just alluding to, is, is, is just as important as promoting Scotland abroad. And, and we work in, in both areas. I mean, as you know, the British Council uh, exists to create international opportunities for the uh, people of the UK and other countries. Uh, we have uh, over 200 offices uh, in more than 100 country, countries, and we're, we're reaching about 24 million people face to face. So uh, at any time, there are an awful lot of uh, programs and events um, taking place. Um, in the arts, there's been a, um, a focus on bilateral years. So uh, at, uh, at the moment, there's a, there's a UK-Brazil uh, bilateral program which is running for five years called Transform. Uh, there's a bilateral program with China. There's one with Mexico. Uh, so there are these, uh, I think they're called seasons, um, year on year, where uh, uh, there will be, be a particular effort made to uh, encourage <laughs> cultural exchange with, with another country. But, but I think we shouldn't uh, forget about the international mindset at home as well, and that's a, a, an area that we have a number of programs like Erasmus+, Plus, like the Foreign Language Assistance, um, uh, ISD Connecting Classrooms. All of these programs are designed to get young Scots to be more international in their outlook and to, to think internationally as well. Last time we spoke, there was um, a bit of a drop in young people taking up Erasmus and some of the, the, the programmes. There was lots of young people coming to Scotland, but not as many going out, and there was a concerted effort it, to try and change that. Has that changed? It, it has. Um, actually, the, the take-up of Erasmus has, has increased a lot in the last year. Unfortunately, the take-up of um, connecting classrooms has gone down a bit, so we're having to do more work to try to get schools to um, t take the international agenda more seriously. Uh, in 2014-15, in we, um, we worked with about 940 organisations across Scotland, and that was including 588 schools, 18 higher education institutions, and 25 further education institutions. So um, we are working with a, a large percentage of the schools, but, but, but the numbers have gone down, in fact, rather than gone up. 
And as we know, the uh, foreign language assistants, uh, we're getting less of them uh, coming to Scotland than we used to. The numbers going um, uh, of language assistants going out is, is, is actually uh, stayed high. Uh, so it's, it's the converse of the problem you have with student flows. Yeah. I think it's worth reflecting that it's quite normal for colleges and universities to operate in an international way. Um, I, I was part of a student football team that had 12 different nationalities within it, and that's quite normal, and it's hugely enriching then for everybody. Um, I, I trust that the committee will have received uh, loftier reports from the institutions themselves as part of this process. So. I suppose my job is just to try and tie that back to sport and activity. I think there are, and I've highlighted three themes in, in, some, in a brief submission, which we might talk about later. I think there, there are two interesting things, um, axes to, to keep in mind. One is where we try to position Scotland. Um, there's lots of activity happening at institutional level um, against their own priorities. And there's actually quite a lot of activity at a British level um, because of the, some of the structures that we work within. So the question then is where do we place Scotland in all of that? Um, and I think to help answer that question, it's then about how much we try to join up the different areas that are represented today, sport, education, culture. Um, and I, my sense is that there's a lot of good stuff going on, but not necessarily that that's either fully appreciated by everyone who's involved or necessarily tied together. Um, so I think there's probably a bit of room there. Um, but I hope you got a sense from the brief submission of just what a lot of activity there is uh, and, and some of the benefit of that work. One of the things that we'll attempt to do on this committee is a bit of a mapping exercise to see if we can map what's happening where. But I have to say with the volume of written evidence we've got in so far, that's going to prove to be a very, very uh, difficult piece of work to undertake. I think maybe a worthwhile piece of work um, for us to see what, what's happening and where and in what frequency and what intensity. Um, it would be very important indeed. I've got Liam next. Yeah, Liam. Yeah, I was going to pick up on Neil's point around consistency because I think that's something that we really noticed with our tour to India last year, which built on a previous tour in 2012. And we took a very deliberate choice to structure the tour to allow more space to explore <laughs> partnerships while we were there. So not just be about presenting work, but to actually understand how the cultural infrastructure in the various cities and locations that we were um, touring to worked. Um, and that's already kind of having a very deep impact on the company in terms of thinking about how those partnerships are taken forward. There's even talk around potential co-productions in some areas. Um, and I think this, the, the sort of profound sense that then has on the professionals that you're taking on these tours helps develop the international at home that Lloyd's talking about because the company's outlook has definitely shifted because of the extended tour that they had last year in a way that I think when they returned from 2012, they felt it was such a whirlwind, it was perhaps harder for them to really focus in on what it meant and what it could mean for the future. So there's, it's, it's, I think, understanding how really profound international engagement takes time at every stage of the process in terms of the planning and the commitment of resource to that, but then actually in the delivery so that you're not just shipping in your best shows and then shipping them out again, that around that you can build these opportunities for engagement that then shapes strategically how you, you approach international working when you're back at, at, back at base. That's an interesting um, contribution. I've got um, Mary and Stuart who haven't contributed yet, and I would want to give you the opportunity. And I think, you know, on the back of what Liam's just said about, you know, how... The, the legacy of something in, in that respect. Um, I maybe come 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 to you, Mary, to maybe talk a bit about the work that in the past few years that Sport Scotland's been involved in. Yeah, um, I mean, I think the the inter sport in an international context, obviously, the very obvious things are the staging of major events, the gaining, the collaboration, the staging of events, which Stuart can talk to, and then the links into sport specific bodies that will collaborate in order to deliver that. Um, I think from our perspective, the interesting and, and possibly, I think, somewhat untapped area in sport is around um, the kind of more grassroots international <coughs> collaborations, which are at the moment extensive but relatively ad hoc 
So you will find, as Stuart's demonstrated with a lot of the universities um, and also sports clubs, there's huge amounts of international exchange taking place there. But actually harnessing some of that into some um, well-supported, meaningful, structured uh, programmes with an intent that maybe delivers a little bit more than they're getting out of it at the moment um, is an area that we, we haven't possibly built on to the extent I think we could. Um, and I think the growing area around, it probably taps into a growing area around sport for change and sport for development where perhaps the sporting outcome isn't the essential outcome but sport is a very major hook on which other forms of international collaboration can then take place. So sport in the context of development or in post-conflict areas where sport has been used as a tool for change and a tool for development. And international collaboration around that, I think, is an area where we could definitely grow and contribute, but also learn. There's definitely that scope for change. I think the kind of work that we've done in staging major events is is relatively well developed and we've got a lot of experience in that area but it's what we then build on around that for grassroots engagement Do you think having Scotland House at the Commonwealth Games and having the themed days because I was at two themed days, mm -hmm. one was LGBT mm -hmm. uh, matters and the other one was um, about yeah. women yeah. Um, and women in sport but it wasn't yeah. just about women in sport it was about women's issues mm -hmm. around the world it was about yeah. LGBT issues around the world yeah. I think there was a day based on sort of yeah. a trade and development of uh -huh. business links yeah. so it, I mean, is, is that a model that, that you think was very successful and, and could be replicated? I think those opportunities to have those international discussions with people when they're there and they're, they're uh, an easy audience to capture are important. I think some of the equalities issues that came through the Games that were highly visible in terms of things like the Paris sport activity, the Pride House, um, were really uh, quite exciting for sport to be able to have those quite upfront debates about sport, about its strengths and some of its areas to be grown and developed. Um, and, you know, there, there are some legacies from that. So the European uh, Lesbian and Gay Sports Association will be holding their convention in Glasgow next March. Um, I'm sure that's partly because there was a really strong signal that that is welcome in Scotland and welcome in Glasgow. Um, so, yeah, I, I think those things do make a difference in terms of sending a message that we want to advance and develop these areas of, of sport and culture. I mean, it was it was a... It was a much broader debate, obviously, than just sport. But sport provided that opportunity and that platform. Do you think that maybe some of the, the countries have maybe got some questionable human rights um, he, um, histories, let, let me put it diplomatically that way, um, did you think that message was heard? Because I know there was a lot of work done with the Refugee Council, with the campaign to welcome the refugees, with um, Amnesty, you know, and some of the organisations in, in gender and zero tolerance and people like that. You know, there was work, really close work done with, you know, really rights-based organisations in that, that sense. Do you think some of those messages that we sent out were heard in other parts of the world where maybe there's, there's maybe a bit of an intolerance to some of the things that, that we... Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to evidence whether they had been heard or not, but I do think they were visible and I think they were noted and commented on. And I think that awareness raising is definitely you know, a start. Um, I think uh, they have led to other forms of engagement. Uh, we ourselves have got a much closer relationship with equality-based organisations in Scotland as a consequence of that. So we have an equalities committee within gender, Scottish Women's Convention, BEMIS, and um, the Equality Network. And that's been enhanced by a major sporting event creating a major signal about these things matter in sport and has actually opened, I think, doors in sport to... Um, organisations to genuinely feel that sport wants to have a dialogue there. I think the time is quite um, healthy for us to take that dialogue out beyond the one we're having in Scotland, to look at how we then connect that to some of the agenda you're talking about internationally where those equalities and those rights are, are absolutely not as um, uh, you know, they're not part of the, either the culture or the, um, the way in which the country is run. And I think sport can be a very helpful tool to open that discussion. Yeah. So that takes us to you, Stuart, because you create these events and, you know, create the infrastructure and um, put on the shows. So tell us what your thoughts are. 
Um, well, I mean, I guess from, from our perspective that, that we're working to a national event strategy which, which fits in with the government's economic strategy, the international framework, the cultural strategy. So Scotland, the perfect stage, is, is the national event strategy. Uh, and we take a lead role rather than the lead role in delivering that. So actually a lot of the agencies that are around the table take lead roles in, in delivering parts of that as well. It's very much a, a, a Scotland strategy, not a, an event Scotland strategy. Um, but one of the specific parts that we do in that is, is we have what we call an international programme, which is around 30 to 40 events a year. Uh, and those can vary from very big international events. So that could be, a, I mean, particularly, we, we led for Scotland on the Ryder Cup, for example, um, right, right down to relatively small international events. So um, if you think about, uh, I'm going to pick a sporting event, but think about something like Keltman, which is a 250-person um, extreme triathlon in Torridon area. Uh, but that's a truly internet. I've done it three times. Have you? Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's a truly international event because of those 250 competitors, only four or five of them are Scottish. Uh, they all bring people with them and the, the television pictures from that event go out all around the world and, and they actually sell Scotland to the world. So, so I guess in terms of our internationalisation, there's probably three components really that, that, and, and, and each of them is very complex, but the first one would be international relations we have to influence people who might want to bring events here um, or come to events here. So we need to have that those international connections with, with sports right holders, with cultural organisations, with other countries who we can learn from. Um, so there's that whole part about talking to people. And, and, and you mentioned Scotland House. During the, the course of the Commonwealth Games, we had 27 um, international sports federations came to it. To, and you'll, you'll know there were only 17 sports in the Commonwealth Games. It was actually people that we invited to come over and have a look at what was happening, what a good job we were doing as Scotland um, a, across all aspects. And actually, interestingly, a lot of them were very, very interested in the cultural programme and the Scotland House activity, and less interested in some ways in the sports activity because they've seen that before. They know how to do that bit. So that international relations is one. I think one of the key things that, that we do, and, and, and I guess being part of Visit Scotland is really the, the, the bit that really works this, is, is the, that profile. It's getting the coverage. Um, so once we've got these fantastic events in Scotland, it's actually making sure that they're projected internationally, whether that's television coverage, whether it's online, and, and that we're putting the right message around that, that there's a fit with what we want to say about Scotland. Um, and, and the whole strategy is predicated on sweating our assets, uh, which is, you know, what, what Scotland is good at, what we have, our people, our, our natural environment, our heritage, our culture. It's actually sweating those internationally to say, let's tell people about that, let's get the profile out there. So a lot of what we might do with the, the homegrown events is actually help them internationalise by getting that profile, by working on international marketing and media. I think the third strand then is is the people that come to those events and and. You know, again, a lot of these aren't necessarily events that were, were generated by bids from Event Scotland. A lot of them are events that have existed for a long, long time. But you look at something like the International Festival, they're bringing over international performers from all over the world who have a fantastic experience here and then take that back into the sector. That happens across sports events. We had the Mountain Bike World Cup at the weekend there. A lot of Scottish riders in it, but actually the vast majority of the riders are international, Europe, South America, Australia, New Zealand, South, America, uh, South Africa. And then there's, there's, there's the officials, the judges, the media that all come internationally, and then the audience. And again, we judge our international events to be those that, that are attracting um, 15, 20% at least of their audience from outside of the UK. We also fish a lot in, in the, the rest of the UK market, but, but certainly those that we consider to be international will be having a significant percentage of the audience from outside of the UK. So we haven't got the statistics back from the Mountain Bike World Cup, but I'd be surprised if there weren't 15 to 20 percent of the 10,000 people who were there over the weekend who came from outside UK. Um, and and that's, that's, again, projecting an image of this is a really well-run event. Scotland's a very capable country. We do the food well. We do the organisation well. We do the transport well. It's really important in terms of those people's experience going back and what they say and they think about Scotland, their propensity to visit again. Um, so actually, that's a that's an area. The international area is one that we work in all the time. Bike World um, Championships um, at Fort William again. Yes, uh, it the, was. Yeah, the Nevis Range. So the backdrop's amazing. It, it's absolutely yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I take it that's the Commonwealth Tartan you're wearing. It's what's hey? Commonwealth Tartan. It is the Commonwealth tie, uh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie McGregor. <laughs> Thanks very much, convener. Um, 
I, I'm very interested by the, um, the, the what do we call the, 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 the people who do have done tours lately, like the Scottish Dance Theatre and the Scottish National Theatre, particularly as to how the sort of contemporary and cutting edge uh, modern dance uh, intermingles with the more traditional um, dances, uh, cultures of, say, India and, and, and China. And, and, and how, and the other point more generally is, I'd like to know what the barriers are to their organisations, and, and are there political barriers? Yeah. Um, again, the, the tour we've just done, we, we had lots of opportunity to kind of explore those connections, um, both in terms of reactions to the presentation of the work, so our, our work is contemporary dance, um, and the audience was often coming from ranges, different sorts of groups uh, and just publics um, who might be engaged in more classical forms of, of Indian dance. But around that, we created as many opportunities as we could for discussion and debate to happen. Uh, and that was where the real fascinating uh, kind of points of the tour took place because we really had... Um, there was opportunity for people who were trained in very strict classical Indian forms to say, well, actually, you're f how do you get to that expressive place where actually... It's coming from the instinct in terms of the dancer's body and the dancer's expression rather than it must be done like this and only when you can do it like this can you then explore other forms, which is um, a very c concise way of explaining perhaps some of the tradition within Indian classical dance. And that exchange was the, was the fascinating um, point. Um, and there you know, lots of opportunities around that, workshops with, with school groups and professionals to, to explore that. Um, the political point is a, is a real one, particularly, I would say, in China. We, all of our work had to pass through a, a censorship process. Um, one of the, the works that we toured, Winter Again, has a, uh, the use of fake blood in it quite repeatedly, and nearly all of it had to be cut, cut from the piece for it to be allowed to be presented um, in, in China. Um, and... One of the other works that we had originally started talking to the promoter about touring, a piece called Yama, was actually ruled out completely. Um, for reasons we've never fully actually understood, but sometimes sometimes it's very clear to understand w what that censorship has been about, and other times less so. Um, but I still think it, it, you have to kind of navigate those political challenges in order to create those moments of engagement. And again, Winter, again, although it wasn't presented in how... It, we present it here, it was still fascinating to understand the reactions to that piece of work um, when, when audiences got a chance to engage with it. Yeah. Neil, did you want to come yeah. here? Yeah. Well, we've had quite a lot of experience of working in China and working with China indeed as well. Um, and each time has been different, but the first time we took David Gregg's play for young people, The Monster in the Hall, which toured to China, and we had a real issue with that in that one of the characters in the show is clearly gay or he's certainly defined as being gay. And there was a real issue with the, with the, the authority about us presenting that to a young audience in China. Um, we, we kind of stood our ground, <laughs> um, and what we said was, if you surtitle the show, you, that's your prerogative, how you surtitle. We can't, um, we can't necessarily tell you how to do that, although we do have an associate director who's Chinese who works for us, who is, in, who is brilliant. So I literally sat with her and said, tell me every time they change a word up there to what we're saying. And there were quite a few. But we, um, we held the ground on what we said. So we did the text as written. And it was really clear that when, they when, the, when the translation was changed, the audience completely knew and just laughed because they were like, he's not saying that. <laughs> That's not what that word is. And it actually, in a sense... <laughs> it almost shows the weakness of censorship. <laughs> it, ca it kind of overrode it. It became more of an issue because they tried to censor it. That was the only time we had direct in intervention. We, we just taught Dunsinane, David Gregg's play, um, that's David Gregg's play, um, which is the kind of his, his contemporary follow-up to Macbeth, effectively. And the Chinese loved that bit because it's, it's fiercely political. The show is really about... Iraq and Afghanistan, although it's really about Scotland and England as well. And we played it in Taiwan as well as in mainland China. And the Taiwanese saw themselves as the Scots and the English as the Chinese. The Chinese saw it the other way around. So you get all these resonances that you never quite realize are going to be there. And we also taught that show to Russia 
just when the Russia-Ukraine situation was kicking off. So that was also that's, that sense of one large country trying to deal with a smaller neighbor was really prevalent. And finally, and probably the most, um, going back to what Liam said, I think that sense of not just taking work there, but actually working and collaborating. We have a show called Dragon, which is a co-production with Tianjin Children's Theatre Company from China. And that's actually playing the International Festival in Edinburgh this year. S some good seats still available. Um, and we use Chinese artists in that show, and that's been really fantastic. So uh, two of the performers are Chinese, the associate director is Chinese. And then the issues become much more about how much you pay them, because we're paying much more than they were doing in China. It becomes about logistics then. But what they bring creatively to the project is extraordinary. I mean, they transformed that project for us. Um, so each time it's different. And I think, as Liam said earlier, there's, there's, there are huge challenges, but it's incredibly invigorating as well. And you learn more. You learn more about your shows as well. You come back with a different sense of what that show is and that sense of what you often think as being local is in fact what hugely international and probably for us black watch is the best example of that which you know a show about a very small group of people from a part of scotland which which just translates everywhere Scottish Government is working very closely with British Council in China to open up those opportunities in, in, in respect of touring and co-production. I think it's, uh, I'm right in saying that there are something be like between three and 400 new venues in China that have been built over the last 12 months alone. And China is, is actively looking at how it can populate those venues with content. So there's real opportunity for Scotland, I think, in terms of working closely in connection with China to, to, to get our, our uh, companies and, and, and artists out uh, right across China. Lloyd, did you want to come here? Um, well, uh, there's a, a couple of points I wanted to pick up on. Actually, on the Dunson Inn in, in Russia, so there was, um, you know, I mentioned before about there being these seasons or years of cultural exchange. So that had been programmed uh, before uh, the Ukraine uh, crisis. Um, and uh, were sort of tough decisions after Ukraine whether to, to carry on with that cultural year. Uh, I think it's it's good that we did because it kept doors open, and uh, Dunsmuir was a was a hit in in uh, in Moscow, and uh, and and I think that was an important channel to to keep open, despite the conflict that we had at the political level between the countries. Um, just coming back to a couple of points, one one was um, uh, Liam's about. You know, you have the, the big events and the big uh, 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 overseas tours and projects, but um, uh, getting artistic exchange or, or collaboration to, to happen on the back of that is very important, as is skills transfer as well. So uh, for the British Council, I mean, in a way we're using uh, these, these, um, the, these uh, cultural offerings as a way of building international relations, and I think it's the the longer term relationship and trust that you build on the back of such uh, tours that, 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 that matters a lot. Um, the other thing I think is about uh, where you do things because um, there's a lot of countries in the world and you can do a lot of stuff uh, everywhere. Uh, so how you, you, you uh, concentrate resources. Um, I mean, the Scottish government's published its international framework which tends to sort of concentrate on the Scottish diaspora, Europe, uh, a few emerging uh, economies and um, a couple of developing countries. Uh, so, so, so deciding where you're going to concentrate effort matters. With, with um, Creative Scotland, we have a strategic partnership. And for the last three years, we've been concentrating effort on Brazil, India, and South Africa. And we've seen you know, the result of that being a lot of artistic exchange and new ideas, particularly with Brazil. Neil, did you want to come back and then, Jamie? I mean, there are a number of... A big issue for us is that we, we, we have an ethical policy. The, the problem with eth ethical policy is that countries change their ethics very quickly. <laughs> and what, when you have fixed something up, is absolutely... Your hands are absolutely clean. By the time it comes to doing it, you have quite a big question mark over, should we be doing this? And we, we genuinely look at it case by case. But I, I also wanted to say, the help of... of British Council in, in, in Russia particularly was, was enormous and their, 
the determination almost that, that we should come and that we should do this show because this show particularly actually said something about the situation was huge and, and, and also when we're in China we've had massive help from both British Council and Scottish Government officials who help steer you through some of the more tricky protocol often, <laughs> particularly in China, protocol issues. So that, that sense of making the, getting those connections right before you go out there is huge for us. Jamie, did you want to come back in? Well, I'd actually, just on the question of ethics, I'd like to raise another subject, if that's possible. Um, how does the Scottish student sports um, uh, sort of transfer to its members a, a way of um, getting over the revulsion which young, especially footballers, must feel at what appears to be the, the, the sort of culture of corruption going through FIFA? Well, yeah, very <laughs> hot off the press. Um, I think everyone would join, if I can infer from your question, would join in the, that revulsion that you speak of about what happens in football at global level. But I, th I think, in truth, it feels so distant to, you know, almost everybody that plays football uh, to, to the point that it's not particularly an issue on the ground. I think um, one of the marvellous things about sport, actually, but particularly student sport, is this melting pot that I referred to earlier. It's just normal for everybody to, uh, to run along together, different nationalities. We've got a very strong approach to uh, some of the minority issues that Mary talked about earlier on. Um, and therefore, people just respond to the environment that they find themselves in, uh, which is a very different one, I hope, to, to what people might experience at FIFA. Um, to answer your point in a more technical way, our job principally is to transfer the, the good guidance that we would get from Sport Scotland or from the particular national governing bodies of, of sport and translate that to a student audience. Um, and, and I hope you'd find that the Scottish FA uh, have a much stronger line on these issues than their international counterparts may have. I, mean, I think from, from our perspective, we obviously work with the international federations quite a lot. Um, in football terms, it was more UEFA that recently bidden for the uh, Euro 2020 matches rather than rather than FIFA, and, and undoubtedly there are there are all sorts of things that happen all the time. Um, I mean, the approach to sport and culture is quite different in that that sport, in theory, is very much a process driven. It's very structured internationally. There's a there's a very clear path in which in, in which you're supposed to do things. Some of the international federations stick rigorously to that, and some of them some of them don't. Um, some of them change the rules as you go along f for perfectly valid reasons. Some of them change them to suit their own interests. Um, so again, you know, you, you can look at things like the IRB's decision around removing the sevens from, from, from Scotland. Actually, probably on balance, you could see why they would do that. It's, you know, two, two in an Olympic uh, territory, broadcast <coughs> territories, etc. However, in terms of the process, it was completely and utterly flawed because they didn't say that these were any of the criteria on which they were judging it. So they made a bad decision based on their own process and their own criteria. I think that... that part of what we need to do in international influence is we need to know the governing bodies well. We need to know whether they're people that... We, we want them to trust us, but we need to know whether they're people we can trust. So we have very, very good relationships with some of the international federations. <laughs> Others, it becomes more tricky. People move, and then you've got to get to, to know a whole load of new people. What really helps us in that is when we've got Scottish and, and British people on those governing bodies. And, and UK Sport have a programme of, of international influence which tries to get people into those organisations. I think our, our issue in Scotland is that, that we have a couple of Scots who are on in key roles in international sports federations who've really got there by their own efforts. Um, and I think that uh, they're actually looking at Scotland's international influence whether, whether it's every sport, having three or four people, five or six people who are in key positions in world sport actually would really, really help us um, internationally because those people have influence over, over other sports bodies. So that's, that's one of the things that I think would help us actually tackle that corruption side of things because we can have a positive influence from a, from a moral point of view. I think within... To, to, to compare that to the cultural side, the cultural side is so much more organic that you can actually m much more choose the approach you take. And if there's somebody you don't want to work with, there's plenty of other people you can work with, which is which is where I think the two the two fields are very very different in terms of how you do it. Although, although what you're trying to do might be very similar. 
Jamie, did you want to come back? Or... Um, no, it's just what I was trying to get at, I mean, I think that it's been covered, in fact, was, was just the ethos of sportsmanship and honesty, which runs from grassroots sport. Uh, and, and children, you know, and students being brought up to think that way, uh, and then having their whole, you know, horizon shattered by, by what they see as this culture of corruption, which appears to have been running for a long time. And it's not only in football, it's in other things too, at the head of things. And, and that's money from our organisations, which is going to be used for the wrong reasons, uh, which could have been used to, to help grassroots sport. Uh, and that, that's what I feel is very, very strongly about that. Uh, but, but I just, that was what I was, point I was trying to make. Really? How do you explain that to a young person? Really? I think um, you know, Stuart's covered it in large part, but I think one of the things that we could possibly make more of is the good governance of sport that we do have in Scotland. It's uh, absolutely part of all of our investment process that there is strong ethical anti-corruption, anti-betting, compliance with uh, the doping legislation. I mean, we will not invest in a governing body of sport unless we are absolutely solid about the governance of that sport. Um, I think that actually, as, as Stuart's pointed out, there's a lot of merit in some of those individuals having been through those processes of modernising their sports, of developing policies that are strongly ethical, um, of actually being able to share and showcase some of that with the rest of the world, where they are trying to develop sports in cultures where... Um, potentially some of these are just how they do business and we're trying to actually, um, I guess, uh, we have a lot to offer in terms of supporting other countries to do business and sport better. Um, I think there's a lot we can export there and we haven't been able to do that to the same extent potentially as we could have done um, uh, had we had more... Scottish voices on some of those international and, and better international relationships at a grassroots and a sports development perspective. I think we have strong international connections to do with the way events are managed and things are represented there. But in terms of grassroots sports development, how you build clubs, grow clubs, govern those clubs, there's a lot that Scotland could um, showcase. Scottish culture, sort of fairness and sportsmanship, yeah. is very important to transfer to the rest of the world. That's what I I'm think there's a lot that we could help support there. Yeah. Yeah. Anne. Oh, thanks, thanks, convener. Um, Dr Anderson and Stuart Turner have already touched on this, but um, to enable others to speak on it, it's about going back to the Scottish Government's international framework and their international engagement. Can I ask um, how they would work or how they work with the Scottish Government to deliver the international engagement priorities and how much of a priority is it for your organisation that you do that? Mm. Lloyd. Um, I, I, so, uh, I mean, we have a regular dialogue with the Scottish Government. So in the production of the country plans that at the moment they're refreshing the India and Pakistan and there's one for the Americas uh, they've, they've, you know we've, we've consulted the, with them quite closely about what it is we, we've got happening in those countries, what uh, links there are, uh, what we're trying to promote. Um, so I think there's a constant dialogue with the Scottish Government about prioritisation and the content of the, of the country plans um, in terms of, a, um, if you like, a kind of a Venn diagram, we're two, you know, the overlapping bit. Um, for the British Council, I would say our priorities are the emerging economies and then also fragile states and uh, developing countries. So um, if the Scottish Government's looking at uh, the diaspora and Europe and emerging economies, the bit that overlaps is more the emerging economies than it is the other parts. Um, <laughs> But we, we both recognize that, and, uh, and we talk about an alignment of purpose uh, in those countries where there's a sort of commonality of, of, of interest. Uh, and obviously, they're the big countries. It's Brazil, Russia, India, China, you know, uh, Mexico, and so on. So the large growing economies uh, are a common interest between us. Um, 
We have an advisory committee, and the Scottish Government has a seat on the advisory committee. Uh, and um, so there, there is a constant dialogue about um, what's happening, where it's happening, uh, where we need to concentrate effort. Neil? Um, yes. Uh, we Obviously, as the National Theatre of Scotland, we're funded directly by the Scottish Government, so we have a lot of dialogue, particularly with, with David Sears and his colleagues, who are incredibly helpful and supportive. Um, and what we... I suppose our key thing is that any partnership has to be driven artistically. You can't put a square peg in a round hole. You can't make a partnership work either with a country or, or, or with a, if, if the match isn't there. So the driving force for us is always the, the show we're working on, whether that's a co-production with an international company or us taking our work out. But we are very, we take cognizance of where those priority countries are. So we have visited Brazil, Russia, China in the last few years. North America is a big partner for us. Um, and interestingly, where we're s s trying to shift our gaze a bit more to Europe, which also, I think, is coinciding with a slight shift within the government's priority countries. Um, it's, it's very hard, actually, for um, surprisingly hard for English language theatre to play in mainland Europe because Europeans are brilliant at just translating it very quickly. As soon as a good Scottish play happens, they'll translate it. The agent will sell the rights and translate it into their own tongue. Or even worse, they'll do it brilliantly in English, which is <laughs> completely galling um, and very infuriating but brilliant on their part. But we are, so we have, uh, we've, we've worked in Poland and, and, and Russia already, but we're certainly starting to look at, at Germany, France as well. Um, but so it's, it's something that we're absolutely aware of, but it's never, pressure is never applied on us to, to say, take the work there, but we're aware of where those key partnerships are for the government and where we can, we try and align those two things together. But I, th and I, I hope David Sears would agree with me on this because he's so brilliant to say in this, but the art is the thing that drives the partnership in the first instance. Liam. I mean, so our direct funding relationship in terms of core funding is with Creative Scotland as a regular funding, uh, regular funded organisation. But in terms of international work, I mean, we have a very close relationship with co colleagues in government on international, and that manifests its, itself in lots of different ways. So, um, when we came back from India, the, they were refreshing the India plan, and we were able to feed in very direct kind of experiences into the consultation on that. Um, we're in the final stages of pulling together a tour to Mexico as part of the theme year, the British Council theme year. Um, and then there's kind of interesting ways that connections weave together. So that's part of the theme year, and, and we're getting British Council support through a foundation in Mexico. Um, but the piece we're touring is a Made in Scotland piece. So we've actually secured some onward touring fund through the Made in Scotland fund, which is the Edinburgh Festival's Expo fund. Um, that's given to the Festival Fringe. So it, it's kind of often about strands of activity that's get, that are woven together. Um, and But I, I agree with Neil, so it's got, there's got to be a kind of artistic premise to what you're doing. Um, and with Mexico this autumn, what, what we're trying to explore is touring existing work, but again, using that as an opportunity to explore potential co-production for the future. So working with a, a really well-established and respected classical musical ensemble in Mexico City, Sepro Music, um, to explore uh, yeah, producing a piece together where they would be bring the live music element and we bring the dance element. I think the committee should investigate that piece of work in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. Convener, yeah. yeah I think we have need to experience to be there. it, yeah. Um, <laughs> Janet. So, Creative Scotland was fully engaged in the development of the Scottish Government's international revised, refreshed international framework. Um, when we published our plan last year, our 10-year plan, our, our fifth ambition, so we've got five ambitions in that, the fifth one is centred on international, uh, and it says we want Scotland to be a distinctive creative nation connected to the world. And in the, in the Scottish Government's framework, it talks about our economic, educational, cultural and heritage strengths as celebrated and globally recognised uh, supporting positive international reputation, so a direct correlation there. 
the, 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 there's a focus on innovation and knowledge exchange developing through that framework, and that fits very well with the strategy that we're developing in terms of international. It also fits very well with our new relationship with the Scottish Funding Council, where we're thinking about creative industries, innovation hubs, and what that might mean in a Scotland context. Um, so I think that there, there will be more that will come through in that space that, that joins up very neatly with the approach that's, that's uh, being driven through the international framework. That answer your question, Sam? Yeah. It very much did so. Thank you, Adam Ingram. Uh, thanks, Convener. Could I could I return to a question that Jamie posed at, at the outset about barriers that your organisations face in terms of your international engagement, or affect uh, the effectiveness of, of that engagement. I mean, could you distill um, and give us one example of what are the, the key barriers that you're, you're, you're facing? And the second part of the question is, I'm amazed that actually nobody has really focused in on funding <laughs> for, for any of these activities so far. Um, uh, in terms of how, how well funded are they, where, where do the funds come from? Is it, are you totally dependent on the public sector or how well have you engaged with Scottish, um, <coughs> Scottish companies in terms of funding uh, this international engagement? I mean, there are some rich companies out there with uh, very Scottish products. I'm thinking of likes of whiskey and, uh, and the like. Um, how, well are, how well are you doing in terms of actually attracting funding from the private sector as well. Oh. Sorry, that... Uh. Stuart. With, with the barriers question, I mean, I, I think there, there are a couple of things, um, and I guess I'd, I'd already alluded to one of them in terms of the, the cultural sector, is that, uh, that, that when we were looking at events and bringing events in or supporting events to, to push their messages out, that the channels in culture are less well defined. And I think one of the things that, that would be really good from, from an events perspective, and I know we do some of this work, is actually to try and, from a Scottish perspective, we could actually create some of those channels. So actually having, um, and it's happened around the festival before, but actually creating an international ministers of culture summit, um, you know, some kind of international culture summit, because the idea is just, just to, to say, well, actually, where where can we uh, where can we create that? Now, I know there's there's been some of that's happened previously, and we've certainly done it uh, uh, in individual genres. It's happened, but it's less structured. It's more organic. Um, w would be my observation. Others others may have different views on that. Um, I think the other barrier, if I, if I go to sport, and, and again, this, this is in danger of being political, but it's just an observation, is that in terms of bidding for international sports events, for the majority of sports, we have to go through a British or UK governing body. Um, now, that's not necessarily a problem. We have very good re relationships with them, but actually they have a remit for the whole of the UK, and they may choose to put an event in Wales or London or elsewhere in the UK rather than in Scotland, and there your access to the international market is very, very structured in, um, in sport. So Scottish cycling can't bid for an international event. It has to be British cycling. That, that can be a barrier. We work very hard on relationship management so that it isn't a barrier. So we work really closely with those, with those British federations. But undoubtedly, it means that sometimes you have to just eat your share of the cake rather than getting the whole of the cake. Um, so those would, those would be a couple of barriers. It, in terms of the, the funding, um, I, I think that, that, that it's almost how long is a piece of string in, in you know, could you deal with more public funding? I, I think from, a, from, a perspect, from our perspective, the, the events that we support, um, we're approximately about 20 to 25 percent of funding across a piece of those. So th there's always um, other funders. Sometimes that'll be other public sector agencies. So there's a number of things we'd co-fund co with Creative Scotland, for example, or with local authorities. But but actually, if you go across a piece, the commercial income and private sector income is usually more than 50% of, of the income into those events. Um, so you look at the, as I say, Mountain Bike World Cup at the weekend, just using that because it's a current example, it's about 70% of commercial 
um, and private sector income, so sponsor income or ticket sales, um, which I think, you know, given the benefits that it brings to Scotland, is actually a pretty good mix of, of what's there. Um, so whilst uh, in no way would I say we don't need more money, um, it's probably around specific projects and specific big events that come in rather than, rather than on the ongoing portfolio. I think Hansel has got a quick supplementary on calls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's actually, it's, it's both uh, yourself and Creative Scotland. How many cities do you actually engage with who have twinning agreements around the world in terms of promoting Scotland? And one of the examples I want to give you is uh, the Glasgow Twin City in Nuremberg in Germany, where they have a burn supper uh, um, every year. And it's, a, it's an event that's totally sold out. And uh, it attracts a lot of uh, um, private money for that event. And I'm wondering whether we do that in other Twin Cities as well, or, or would you be interested in developing that concept to have that developed to other cities as well, to have similar types of events which very clearly promote Scotland. It's a very Pacific burn supper event. Uh, and I think the fact that we take haggis from Scotland to uh, Nuremberg every year as well. So. Would you be interested in promoting that in other cities and would you be willing to speak to cities about the twin partners, touring partners? We are interested uh, and we do that in partnership with cities and, and, play, and towns in, in Scotland. So uh, Creative Scotland has a, a relationship with all of the 32 local authorities in Scotland um, and through that we would have conversation with twin cities and other places in other parts of the world. We, <coughs> if I'm very honest, I think we've had a formal arrangement around the MOU with the British Council uh, in the way that we've worked internationally. Uh, I've been very keen since I began my role at Creative Scotland that we think hard in terms of, of what else we might do internationally. So we've committed to producing an international strategy this year which will uh, line up with the Scottish Government's international approach. And within that, clearly, we need to think about what we can do to connect with uh, people from Scotland um, elsewhere in a, in a more meaningful way. Um, I attended the Chinese Burns uh, Night in Edinburgh, in fact, um, in, which, which, which was he, albeit here, but a fantastic example has got how Scotland was, was working um, in, a, in, a, in a really integrated way with, 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 um, with people from China. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunity the, through those kinds of things. Where you're proposing to do, or are you still in the in the negotiation and talks stage at the moment? We're still in the in the right, process. Okay. Creative Scotland's <coughs> role is a funder and a development agency, and it's really important, I think, that we work through and with the organisations that we fund and the places that we fund in Scotland. So we would want to have conversations with with the 32 local authorities across Scotland in terms of where they might want to connect with, um, as well as, a, as, as, as pull together the knowledge that we hold as an organisation in terms of where the opportunities are. Right. And ours will probably exist at, at, at two separate levels. So, so the, the, the kind of level you're talking about there, which is sort of almost event specific, uh, a lot of the events have those connections. And again, we would advise help. And, and if we could, we would facilitate those. And then there are those that we would have as an organisation. So we have a formal MOU with New Zealand government around um, exchanging events best practice. And we've even had a staff exchange with them. Um, and we have less formal agreements with Denmark, with Finland, and with the Vic state of Victoria and Australia, again, which is around us exchanging intelligence, particularly where we're not direct competitors, where, where we would exchange intelligence around events, um, around measurement, um, and various other things that, that, that are in there. So, so some of those exist, uh, if you like, at our level, where they're our direct relationships. Others, I think, are much more appropriate for the events themselves, and it's more a facilitation role for, for us. Right, okay, thank you. Lloyd. <clears throat> Just to uh, come back to uh, Mr. Ingram's question. Um, in terms of barriers, I, I guess the British Council in country is there to try to uh, reduce those barriers. So um, for uh, um, you know, Scottish National Theatre or whoever, we're trying to make life easier in, in, in country and, and, and help them. Um, uh, so for us, we, I would say the, the barrier is, is money. <laughs> Um, it's the amount of money we've got to, uh, to enable more activity to take place. Um, there, is, uh, there is a barrier the other way, which is about uh, visas. Um, and uh, I, last week, I think it was in the FT or, or Telegraph, there was a story about um, Georgian 
a theatre company that was invited to the Manchester Festival. They can't come because they were all refused uh, visas because they didn't have the financial means to independently support themselves. So um, that that's a problem. Um, I suppose you know language can be another barrier. Um, it, I, we've got more evidence from from students that they will tend to either go to somewhere where they speak English, uh, America or Canada or Australia, or they will go somewhere close. Um, so, so Europe, um, which means that it is difficult to get people to go to um, uh, the Far East or, or um, uh, 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 parts of um, uh, East Asia and so on. So, uh, so I think language and visas are barriers, but for us the main barrier is probably having, having the money. In terms of the money that we have, um, our budget is, is about $800 million, uh, a year. Uh, of which about 20% is a grant from the Foreign Office, uh, and the rest of it is earned through teaching English, um, running exams, or, or, or managing contracts for others. So actually the, the, the um, grant in aid from, um, from the Foreign Office is now a, a pretty small uh, the portion of the total. Yeah, Neil? Uh, I suppose for us the, the barriers uh, tend to be about scheduling. Often an offer will come very quickly when you're plan and you simply can't accommodate it. There's, so it's a timing issue often. Um, there's an issue of resource for us, which is that we can't take up all the offers we want to do. Not necessarily financial resource, but more staffing resource. Having, if we have a big show in Scotland, that's where we're going to deploy our key people rather than suddenly pull them off to be in, in the USA or China. Um, although we do, you know, we have access to a large pool of freelance people, but we still need our key people, and we tend to try and make a show if it's internationally a key priority for us. So we want the best people people working on that. Um, funding um, is an issue, but st strangely, not, not necessarily our own funding, because our, our kind of policy tends to be that you know, in the end, we're the National Theatre of Scotland, and we tend to try and concentrate our funds on making work in Scotland. So if our work travels, we try and make it self-supporting. And that's usually through um, the fees that we raise from the festivals or, or, or theatres that, that, that we're visiting, with some help, certainly from the Scottish Government International Touring Fund, which is a fund for the five national companies of uh, £350,000 a year, which... They try and distribute equally, but we always try and get the lion's share. But, but, but we, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It depends on how much we, we have out. But primarily, we're funding it through... So, so it's whether, as, as Lloyd said, often whether it's whether the British Council in that country is helping the partner we're going to. Because often, the big thing that often stops shows, it's not, it's not the weekly fee for the actors. For the act it's a project like the James Plays that we did in Edinburgh last year that we're planning to tour internationally in 2016, which is a huge undertaking. That's more than 40 people on the road. So it's 40 flights, it's 40 hotels a night. It's, that's, in, in a sense, that's bigger than the fee for them. And we don't even see that many. That's an under, what we call that an end of the line thing. That's them to deal with. We just say, we need really good hotels for 40 people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Or 40 flights for people. So that, those are the kind of barriers. In terms of, of also trying to raise money ourselves to, to help, in a sense, to help our partnerships. In, in the USA, we have um, what's called a 501c3 board. So we have a, there's a National Theatre of Scotland America Inc. board, incorporated board, um, which means that we can both raise, we can accept fees and raise sponsorship without tax in the USA. And uh, initially, we did it really as a, as, as a functionary to, to help us get there so we, our fees weren't penalized. As we've done more and more work, and it goes back to what we started with in a sense, that consistency of, visit, of visiting, we built up a network of, of key supporters in the USA who are from, we, ha we have a board with somebody from a main whiskey company is on, somebody from a, a finance company with an American name are on it. And they, in America, they have an expression on th for theater boards, which is get... No, give, get, or get off. That's what you're meant to do. You give money, you get money, or you get off the board. It's a very different way. Because there's that subsidy issue doesn't, it doesn't exist really for them. So that's a change of culture for us to be working with the American board where there's an expectation on them to raise money. And it's, you know, it's starting slowly, but it's building. And I think it's going to be a 
key aspect of future international work for us. And just finally, the question of like burn suppers and things. It's interesting, whenever we, wherever we go in the world, no matter how contemporary we might think and cutting edge we think our show is, they want us to do a burn supper always. So we've done them in fantastic places. Um, we have a show called The Strange and Doing of Prudencia Heart, which is a show that we do in a pub. Um, and we did that in Santa Monica. And on the Saturday night, which coincided with Burns Night, they said, can you not do the show but do a burn supper? So we did a burn, sh burn supper in 80 degree temperature in Santa Monica in January. So we're always looking for opportunities to do that. <laughs> Stu. Just a, uh, one thing to echo and then a, a slightly different point. I um, wanted to underline what Stuart was saying about the Scottish versus British element, which I think is quite important, certainly within sport. Um, and it does ans ask questions then of how we try to influence and so whether we're trying to influence Britain first um, before we go wider than that. But I think the main barrier besides is really one of coordination and uh, you know sitting as we do between education and sport if we're really going to have an impact in this arena then it's about aligning to lots of different sets of priorities what the steer is from the Scottish government how that plays out through the funding council where sports Scotland might fit in um, and also recognizing that each of our member institutions has their own priorities around recruitment of students, for example, um, and international bits of research. So that's potentially quite complex. But the good news is if we can make sense of that and if the, all the stars align, then we're actually in a uniquely useful place, I think, to do some really meaningful work. And it's work that often maybe hasn't been done yet. So I think that's an exciting opportunity. So I suppose my question or my challenge is whether out with uh, a discussion like this today, whether we've got the right mechanism um, to really bring sport, culture and education together so that we can collaborate to best effect. So, so does that exist? Others may answer that better than I can. Do, do we want one if it, if it doesn't yet exist? Janet. I would echo that and, 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 and fully endorse the fact that I think there could be better coordination um, and better shared access to knowledge and networks than perhaps we're currently initiating. And maybe it's up to us as national agencies to um, take the lead in, in, in terms of, of generating um, closer working. Just on the barriers front, um, the other two points that I would make, one is around digital um, I think a lot of uh, arts organisations and creative industries companies are now exploiting digital in a really meaningful way through opening up to international opportunities and markets. The infrastructure in Scotland is still not strong enough to be able to accommodate that, especially when you think about large file sizes for film or music, where the common practice now is for, for creative people to work together uh, on a, a digital platform um, in many different parts of the world and collaborate. We're not quite able to do that everywhere in Scotland just yet, uh, and we need to work on that. On the um, and, and digital is really important and increasing area for Creative Scotland. We get about 150,000 visitors every month onto our website, which is a significant number of people. In terms of our Twitter usage, it's about 60,000, 20,000 of those are international people, we think. Um, so real opportunities to build on there. In terms of funding, the um, point I would make is, is, is yes, we are stretched, um, as you would expect me to say. Um, but there's a, there's a specific point around the way that we're funded in, as an organisation in that a, a significant proportion of our funding comes from the National Lottery. Um, so therefore, it's constrained in terms of it, what we can use it for. It has to benefit the people of Scotland. Um, <coughs> it's quite difficult to deploy that in terms of international working. So we don't have a lot of spare resource to be able to support um, the development that could happen for Scotland internationally. Um, I think my view is that, is, and my experience of working not just in Scotland but beyond, is that a little bit more resource into international working can unlock a great deal uh, because the fee levels that companies get, I'm sure colleagues will back me up, internationally are often higher than are able to be um, brought in through UK working. Uh, so there is added value in terms of any um, little bit of extra money that goes into international working that could play in quite significantly in terms of overall economic economic gain. Adam, does that answer your questions? Yes, it's, it's certainly a range of 
issues there that uh, we might wish to explore. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to go to Rod, who wants to explore some other issues. Uh, well, not in, in fact, uh, convener, I was. Uh, my questions were largely on budget and uh, largely answered. But could I just uh, pose one question? Um, for the people here today in terms of whether there is a conflict at times between domestic and international engagement, and if so, how are those resolved? Mm. Um, sure. Certainly from an events perspective, and again, I'm speaking from an events perspective, the two are, are totally symbiotic because actually if if you don't have Scottish people at an event enjoying it, if you don't have Scottish suppliers, Scottish food and drink, and you haven't developed that part of it, the quality of experience for any visitors and the quality of your broadcast that goes out it is lessened. So so actually part of our job is to make sure that the you know, we work with the smaller events, we help them grow and develop, and we work with the industry so that the quality is there, so that actually when you are projecting uh, outwards or bringing people inwards, that the, 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 the two things meet in the middle and actually people have the, the, the experience you want them to have because it's, it's very much about people's experience with events. You know, they, they, they go to an event because they want the experience and the experience has to be quality. So I think it, it, for us, we have to have both. Um, so I don't think it really conflicts. Um, that, that I guess the part of it is, is then always comes back to resourcing is where, where, do, you, where do you cut the cake um, but, but I think that within, within the resources you have you have to, you have to develop both sides and they, they work virtuously to help each other hmm. Janet I mean, sometimes international and domestic is one and the same thing so the Edinburgh International Festivals and all these uh, other festivals taking place uh, in Edinburgh and beyond bring fantastic international work for, to Scotland for Scottish audiences and impact on the economy significantly here. Um, and other examples, of course, are the St Magnus Festival um, upon Orkney, um, which, which is a terrific um, international exposition. Um, and the work that organisations like Cryptic do in Glasgow, working internationally uh, as a producing art house, um, <coughs> all fit into that, into, into that, into that, into that theme. Neil. No. I think it's a really good question, especially for for organisations who are producing work and making work as to where you where you where you spend your time, where you put your resource. And I mean, certainly when we first started, we were we were slightly taken aback by the international interest in our work, and it, we got a bit giddy about it and thought, well, it's very, it's all very well being in Sydney, but we really need to be in Sutherland this week or, or whatever. And people started to notice it and said, how come that you're in New York but you're not in Kakadi? Or you know, and, and that was it was a really good early lesson for us um, and in fact I think in our third year we simply said we are not going to tour internationally this year because it's, it's taken it's pulling too much of our resource we've kind of slightly calmed down now and um, I think we, we we've got the balance right in terms of what we see international work doing for the company's reputation for its finances for for the experience it gives our teams as well you know they come back kind of very much match fit I suppose in terms of what we do um, and picking up Janet's point, the, the great if you if you can make international touring work, and it is a bit of a jigsaw puzzle in terms of the funding where it comes from, and indeed you know at NTS we've we've had support from Creative Scotland as well from the Made in Scotland Fund for some of our shows, but if you can get that jigsaw puzzle right, Scotland tends to benefit from it in that if 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 the money if if the fees are right. It enables you to remount a show that you could certainly not have done just to do in Scotland, so that when we do the James plays, I shouldn't be saying this because nothing's been announced yet. So never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> by by us now, I know. But by doing them internationally, by do, no, can you turn that TV off? By, um, by doing them internationally, it enables us to do them in Scotland again. It's one feeds the other, and that's the key thing for us: is that the two things work work symbiotically. I hope. Um, so. It's, it's about a balance, but I think it's, it's a good point because I think you, there can be a temptation to think how exciting and it's like, oh, hang on a minute, <laughs> who's actually, whose money is, is paying for us? It's, a, it's Scottish taxpayers' money. That's where the work should be focused. But that spin-off is fantastic and indeed feeds back in, we hope, to, to Scotland. Yeah. Okay. Willie. Thanks very much. I wonder if I could uh, start by picking up the point Janet mentioned there. You mentioned the whole digital agenda, which is... Um, raised at this committee quite often, um, how to how to see a consistency of approach within Europe 
in relation to the digital agenda, not just for jobs, but to, to increase opportunity throughout the European Union. And there must be issues for you, particularly the cultural organisations, I think, particularly when you're taking, uh, when you're touring. It's not just about people and props, I suppose, these days. It's about, so, it's, it's about multimedia and all sorts of facets. So, so there's very much an awareness at this committee of how important the digital agenda is for a number of aspects. But I wanted to say a wee word about the Burns Supper thing that's been uh, mentioned several times, and I'm sure you'll know that you don't have to wait until January to have a Burns <laughs> Supper. Uh, some associates uh, of mine had a Burns Supper in July in 1986. Oh God, that's 29 years ago. To celebrate what you all know as the Kilmarnock edition of Burns, which was published in Kilmarnock in 1786. So it's lovely to hear that there's such a wide interest in Robert Burns. Not a interest. No, no Coffee at all. all. It's, it's just lovely, lovely to hear that, and, and it would be lovely to hear if there were more stories about that, about the whole Robert Burns experience from taken across the world, not just in January, it's for the whole year. Uh, but the main point I wanted to, to raise, convener, was about whether our friends, particularly in the cultural organisations, how you engage with the institutions of Europe, if at all. If you look at the European Commission's 10-point plan for renewal or whatever in Europe, you don't see culture in there at all. It doesn't feature, and neither is sport. It's not mentioned, and I think it should be. I think it should be centre stage, up front. So my question to you is, do you get an opportunity to try to influence colleagues in Europe, to influence the political dimension in Europe, or is that beyond your, 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 your ability to do that? And if so, how would you, how would you like to go about it? How, how could you do it better? Lloyd. Well, well just on that last point, um, uh, the culture budget and the commission has always been small because of the principle of subsidiari subsidiarity. So. Um, I think it's always felt to have been an area that had to be uh, devolved to the national <coughs> level and therefore um, there is now a Creative Europe desk uh, which, which uh, Janet um, houses in Creative Scotland. Um, I don't know if you... Yeah. Yes, so I, the the um, Creative Europe um, has allocated uh, just under £2 billion pounds between... 2014 and 2020, uh, at the moment, I think it's clear that Scotland isn't getting its fair share of that. We've got some staff now at Creative Scotland who are part of that UK-wide Creative Europe desk to look at providing advice and guidance and support to Scottish organisations uh, in order to help support effort to be able to get into those funds. Um, Creative Scotland is also part of a number of different networks across Europe and globally. So, so we belong to IFICA, um, which is the association that brings arts councils together, um, and uh, ISPA and IETM, which is a European network. Um, we've got two members of staff who are actually presidents of European networks, so um, both in the field of education. Uh, so that's Joan Parr, so she liaises with... Um, uh, policymakers and strategists across Europe in the field of education um, and Ian Smith who's our head of music um, is also the president of a European wide organisation oh. Liam have you got something to add to that yeah um, we've we've just come to the end of a project called RepNet, which was linking um, a series of um, repertory dance companies throughout Europe together with the kind of explicitly aim of exchanging practice and understanding kind of future potential um, and, and we found it incredibly valuable. We didn't raise the funds here, but um, it's that European model where it was raised from another country and we were, Scotland was one of the partnership countries. Um, but it worked on, on all ends of the levels of the company. It wasn't just about the artistic directors and executive staff exchanging. The, the technical directors or, or managers exchanged um, as did marketing and exploring. Um, I suppose there's a very, in terms of contemporary dance, there's a very well-established touring network throughout the main houses in Europe. But it perhaps has less opportunity around it for some of that really interesting exchange that those same companies that tour that circuit have found when they go to um, the developing um, countries, the developing economies. So uh, the kind of rationale behind it was, well, how can we come together and use that as a force for kind of cracking it open a bit more so that it's not just, you know, drop into Paris one night, do a show, move on to Berlin. Um, and just if I could return a little bit to the, the point around resource um, and kind of conflict between uh, national work and, and international work, 
I think there is a, there is a thing around schedules. They never neatly overlap. We're always having to rejuggle. And actually what I think we've learned and are still learning is that you get better at the juggle the more you understand about the, the way that that culture works. And the better you can understand that culture is to do with um, long-term planning horizons, long-term engagement. So it, the plea around if there is ever additional resource investment in that to facilitate long-term relationship building and long-term planning will give that added value, I think, um, tenfold, because it, it, the deeper the understanding, the deeper you can kind of resolve those, um, not conflicts, but those the way that it doesn't neatly stack together in, in, at the first pass. Mary? Yeah, um, in the sport area, it's been interesting because our connections have largely been through health policy in Europe. Um, rather than cultural policy. So we've had quite a lot of opportunity to engage with and influence around DG Health. And um, uh, a lot of that activity has been about harmonising public health messages about minimum levels of physical activity, the importance of activity to health, um, and the role of sport within that. They've also, as part of that health overview, taken a view on anti-doping um, and the relationship between European policy and uh, WADA, the, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and some of the sense checking of uh, governance, I guess, of those issues uh, as well. Does that always work? It worked well uh, recently because, unusually, um, the UK representative was um, uh, from Scotland um, and liaised. The challenges come where we are presented with the opportunity to present a UK perspective. <coughs> Um, and actually the way that we've adopted that has been devolved in each country. So the Sport England perspective may be quite different from the Sport Scotland perspective because of different policy environments around health or sport. So that sometimes presents us with some challenges of coming to a coherent um, view that we feed into that EU mechanism. Um, but there's been a lot of work done, as, as, as you know, as Stuart said, with international federations in sport. There's been a lot of work done between the four home countries of the UK to uh, come to agreed positions that we can put into that mix. Um, slightly different policy takes. A lot of the European policy has been quite concerned with ageing and the demographics of ageing and the impact that has on physical activity and health and sport and access. Whereas in the UK, we tend to have quite a strong focus on young people and opportunities and equality. Hi, just, I'm, I'm very interested in this, about how your counterparts in Europe, particularly on the cultural side, and, and whether they have much more of a proactive or direct uh, engagement with the institu institutions of Europe to get in there, get a seat, not a seat at the table, but get, get funding streams and, and be, be, be represented in something like the Commission's 10-point plan for Europe. I, I just don't understand why that agenda isn't there up front and in your face. It's not, and it should be. So there, there's, it's difficult to engage with, with European institutions, and we, we find that too. So I'm, I'm just going to wonder what your take on it is and whether your counterparts across Europe do it or, or, or don't. Um, I was fortunate to be part of National Culture Summit, which took place in this building, in fact, last August. And that's one of the issues that came up, is why isn't culture part of that main charter, effectively? And indeed, the UN, it isn't either. So I know that one of the recommendations taken away from that was to try and drive that forward. So I'll undertake to try and find where that's got. Um, in terms of, um, I mean, our own experience with, with those kind of European streams of funding is that they're incredibly complex. There used to be a scheme called the Kaleidoscope Fund, that was probably the most complicated funding stream ever. You would spend literally months, and you needed three partners from three different countries, one of whom, God knows, it was, it was incredibly complex. Um, and it almost, felt, it almost felt it was there to put you off doing it. So I think it's, put, it, it's actually stopped people doing it. Um, I know there's a different scheme now, which is a little simpler, but it's still very complicated, and it's, we've... I have to say, we've never really... We, we, we did engage with it once with a company from Germany and a company from Canada, and we weren't successful. Um, but we will continue to look at it. But I, th I think you're right. I think in terms of why isn't culture... And, and indeed, at, at, at that summit, one of the issues came out, going back to Mary's point, was, was, was that linking of culture and health, both, both, both physical and mental health particularly, in terms of what culture does and how culture can be a massive asset in, in breaking down some of, some of those things. So um, I share your um, 
uh, you're concerned that it isn't higher up, the, up that agenda. As I said, I'll try and find out from colleagues who were at the Culture Summit whether it's, that's moved forward at all. That would be helpful. We will have the Cabinet Secretary with us, so we can maybe ask some of these questions as well. But um, hearing from the sector is very important. We are, we are just about out of time, absolutely. We are past the time that, that we, we should have had. But um, Jamie's very, very anxious to get in in his oh. wee final last supplementary. All right. Um, thank you. The, the, the point I was trying to was actually, I agree with Willie Coffey's sentiments about the difficulties of um, engaging with European institutions. And just, you mentioned um, the funding of two billion, which may be, uh, may be available through Creative Europe. What would Scotland's share be of that? What should it be? Uh, that's, I suppose, is my last question. Well, it's application driven from uh, organisations based across Europe, so it's not divided up in terms of countries specifically. Um, the funding is for cultural and creative sectors and then there's a media sub-programme which invests in film, television, new media and games. So it's quite wide-ranging. It's, it's, it's partnership-driven, so uh, you wouldn't apply by yourself. You'd apply with partners from across Europe. Um, so it's difficult to answer the specific question, what, would, what should Scotland's share be? What we've done is calculated a, a rough proportion um, of, of, of what we're getting against our demographic compared to other UK countries, and, and it's disproportionately low at the moment. So clearly there's an opportunity to find ways of opening the door to enabling those partnerships to be made so that Scotland can um, generate um, confidence and, 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 and perhaps we need to do some, some, some workshops and training to help people be able to make the applications um, that might be successful uh, so that we can punch through a bit more powerfully into that programme. It, but it is just under €2 billion, Euros, so, so it is a significant amount of money to, to play for. We have the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure here at the last meeting before we break for, for summer recess, um, uh, looking at um, uh, European structural funds, because it's something within this committee that we've kept a very, very strong strong eye on. And, and we know that, in, for instance, in research and innovation and science, we punch above our weight you know, on some of those indicators as far as you know, securing funding. Uh, maybe that's... Uh, you should maybe have a wee chat with some of our science and innovation people that seem to know how to navigate this system. Neil says it's it's complex. Um, the forms can be quite cumbersome and laborious. So I think we need to think about how we can use our collective resource in, in the most effective way uh, and, 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 and try to support um, the efforts of organisations whose focus really should be on making great work. Um, is there a way that collectively we can, we can think about how to draw in European resource um, in, a, in, a, in a better way than, than, than perhaps it, it's currently working. The is familiar with, with a number of organisations who do exactly that for the education sector and that, so like SCVO and you know the, the West of Scotland Colleges Partnership, they, they do this type of stuff, so it's not as if there's, a, there's not a model there, but um, as being a, a holder of an ESF-funded project many years ago, I feel your pain. Um, I think that actually c concludes our evidence uh, today from, from our guests around the table. We're really grateful for um, the, the very interesting and, and um, uh, creative and, uh, um, ways that you've helped us to understand how your sector you know, communicates with, with the rest of the world and what that brings us and what we, we can give back. We're really grateful for your written evidence, we're grateful for your oral evidence and if there's anything else you think would help us in our understanding of all of this, please keep in touch and, and um, let, let us know what what's happening um, and I think maybe you know if Mexico's a goer that's only a that's only a joke invariably we do all of these things via video conference so <laughs> but thank thank you very very much and I'll briefly suspend just to allow our witnesses to to leave the seats thank you
Okay, um, welcome back to the European External Relations Committee. We're moving on to agenda item three, which for us today is the Brussels Bulletin. You've got the Brussels Bulletin contained within your papers. Um, is there any questions, clarifications? Rod. Well, obviously, just in relation to TTIP, obviously things have moved on. Uh, the plenary session didn't take place. Um, I'm not quite sure entirely why, but although I heard there were a huge number of amendments, so, um, so it's a kind of work in progress as far as yeah. TTIP is concerned. I believe it's been postponed until September. Yeah. Anything else, Willie? Convener page, uh, oh, they're not numbered, it's a health and sport uh, item just in the second last page. Members will notice there that the, the Commission didn't uh, decided not to update the alcohol strategy and that's led to 20 organisations resigning from that particular body. I would like to find out a wee bit more information about what's happened there. That sounds like a fairly serious thing to have occurred and that would be of some concern, I think, to committee members in the Scottish Parliament, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Rod. Just in terms of the energy union, I see that uh, Maros Sekovic is due here in the United Kingdom on the 13th of July. I don't know whether I can find out whether he's proposing to have any discussions with uh, um, any member of the Scottish Government during that visit. Sekovic. Any other comments or questions? Nope. Happy to share the Brussels Bulletin with other relevant committees, maybe highlighting some of the points that were just raised on energy and um, al the alcohol issue to the Health Committee yeah. and energy to the Energy Committee, specifically highlighting those. Eh? Jamie? When we say, do they go to all committees? Does the Brussels Bulletin go to all the committees? Do we ever get any feedback? Sorry? Do we ever get any feedback? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Although the rapporteur, the rapporteur usually on whatever that committee is, takes forward those those issues, and some of those rapporteurs are, are members of this committee. Yeah. So sort of yeah. Okay. Are you volunteering, James? Uh, are you uh, volunteering? Uh, volunteering for for what? Turns out. To, to act to take the message and bring. What do you mean from other committees? No. No. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, I just wondered if anything of interest had come out, you know, back from that. Yeah. Chair, is it fair to say that normally if a committee does find something of interest, they pursue that themselves? They, they have, and mm. then what we get is when we do the, the, the European update of the mm. European strategy and we get the feedback from all of the committees, you can then see the areas where they have picked up and, and did some work on. OK. Yeah. Thank you very much. OK. OK. Excellent. Moving on to agenda item four, which is the item we agreed to take in private. So I'll briefly suspend to allow us to go into private. Thank you.